Um, but also a thank you to all the conference organizers and especially uh, Alex. So basically, we're coming from a slightly outside archaeology, I would say. We have connections to it, worked on a bit of heritage and everything. Um, and we're basically trying to look with two case studies at the ramifications of street art and graffitis, developing digital practice uh, in relation specifically to heritage value, uh, preservation and archaeological kind of investigation. And given the nature of this topic, and also Lachlan's own teaching methods, we've decided to present today using Instagram rather than PowerPoint, which is a bit of an experiment, plus this audio file, and I'm a bit of a Luddite, but I hope for, I'm hoping that we can kind of make it all work. So um, I think this, yeah, so that's just the actual title screen. So uh, the paper's buffing and buffering street art, and I've actually added in, I think, brackets, um, graffiti, uh, they're accelerating archaeologies. Okay, it's all showing up, alright, isn't it? It's kind of odd position. Yeah. So uh, the growing literature that is already problematizing the blurred dichotomies between street art and graffiti as both forms of art and vandalism and mainstream and alternative uh, culture, and this is expanding continuously across disciplines. It's not really anything new. Um, equally, um, the kind of consideration of mark making practices, inscriptions, graffiti, what will you, um, as both a focus for uh, archaeology and heritage studies, um, is also growing in status. Um, yet their practical preservation, as we've heard from case studies today, is often complicated, particularly in the case, I would argue, of contemporary examples of street art or graffiti rather than historical graffiti or inscriptions. Um, it's com compl complicated by the role of illegality, illegibility, anti-commercialism and transients and the role that this, these all play within the living traditions. So even though you kind of have this focus on the fact that they can be both tangible and intangibly preserved, there's this kind of tension. Um, for this reason, most critical commentators tend to emphasize these phenomena as intangible processes rather than tangible products, and in turn favor the preservation by record approach. And in that kind of method, um, we get towards the importance of digital technologies, the internet and social media. I think that's the only time you might see a reference to a Banksy work. Thank God. Um, maybe not. <laughs> I just realized. Sorry. Okay, so one well-known example, as mentioned by Alex, is uh, Cassidy Curtis's Graffiti Archaeology website, which is obviously it's now over 10 years old. It's no longer going past 2009. But more web-based archive projects like this are, are continuing to be created. Um, but at the same time, they're being undermined by um, the wild, big, you know, wild, if you will, big data archives created by social media. Um, again, as perfectly demonstrated by your own project, Alec. Um, <coughs> equally, a new generation of street art and graffiti artists is emerging, which uses social media, the internet, and digital technologies not only to record their work, but also to shape its content and execution. Amongst these are uh, uh, Lush, that's Lush in the top left corner, he'll come back again later, um, Matthew Tremblin and Insa. Um, Getty Images is Tremblin and Insa is the bottom right, which would have been a GIF, but it didn't load. If you want to see the GIF, it's on my Twitter account, actually. Um, these artists often use uh, these new platforms to comment on the consequences of digitalization of street art and graffiti in terms specifically of intellectual property rights and surveillance, but the work of others connect to questions of preservation. And here I'm thinking specifically of uh, Sweezer in Berlin, who is, I think it's awesome. He goes around taking photographs of graffiti and then uploading them using, well, they basically places QR codes in the landscape where they used to exist. So you can go and see old graffiti after it's been buffed. Um, there's lots of other relationships that we could go into between the kind of the, the digital elements and you know, impacts on the graffiti, also rhetorically in terms of tagging and, and hashtagging and all this, but I'll leave them for a moment. So um, all of these kind of relationships, these crossing relationships, means that the analysis of street art and graffiti needs to be, appreciate the overlap and interrelationship of our so-called real and virtual worlds. I think you always need those brackets now. Um, and it's no longer really to ex uh, kind of acceptable to accept the claim of uh, the graffiti archaeology website's uh, kind of blurb, if you will, which kind of actually states this website, something, mirrors the actual public spaces of the city walls in the virtual public spaces of the internet. So this is, this is far too simplified. Um, 
as such, our early efforts to look at our case studies have kind of been framed by the approaches of digital sociology and have connected at least loosely to nascent academic attempts to create a more archaeological or material media archaeology. And here I'm specifically thinking of Colleen Morgan and Sarah Perry's work on that, on that topic. Um, so having kind of briefly set up, I'm going to rush through the first of the case studies and, hope, and then start this recording. Um, and the first case study comes from Berlin. It's um, a vacant plot known as uh, the Curvy Bracker in the district of Friedrichshain Kreuzberg, where in July 2007, Blue and JR, uh, street artists from Italy and France, collaborated on a huge mural for one of the city's earliest street art exhibitions. Following the uh, partial erosion of the piece, Blue returned in 2008 and repainted it, and at the same time created a second piece kind of spontaneously uh, with the help of the exhibitor, uh, exhibition's organiser, Lutz Henker, a local uh, graffiti artist, street artist, writer. Um, there isn't enough time to discuss each of these murals' designs, although I'd love to because they're amazing, but both basically index the geopolitical as well as social cultural changes that Berlin as a whole and the district in particular have experienced since German reunification and more so in the past decade. To generalise, um, the murals, and I know that's dangerous, uh, the murals and the plot at first exemplified basically the kind of cultural potential of Berlin's disused spaces. Um, and then later came to be embroiled in an index more problematic kind of processes of urban change to the extent that they were recognised to be key drivers of gentrification in that area within a particular form of gentrification, uh, uh, tourist gentrification. And also, as people like uh, Cameron McCauliffe have noticed, their kind of the relationship to um, creative city discourses were kind of emphasised. Um, the, all these connections became... Uh, increasingly evident, um, well, they were evident in long-standing, uh, but as yet unrealised plans to develop, <coughs> develop the plot, um, but became more so when these were integrated into a broader plan to develop uh, and therefore limit access to 3.7 kilometres of uh, Berlin's riverfront, the so-called media spree uh, development plans. Um, these were imposed by various different uh, citizens' initiatives with some limited success, and then controversy centred directly on the plot within, these, uh, within this plan when um, there were further plans to unveil a temporary exhibition on the idea of urban lifestyles. And actually, Lutz Henker was involved in, the, in these plans, so there was a crossover here. So the pro protesters occupied the plot and prevented the exhibition, but also facilitated its transition into an informal settlement where various disadvantaged and alternative communities took up permanent refuge. So then in the press, the plot was uh, uh, labelled as a slum in the heart of a European capital, <coughs> all the time while Blue's iconic, and this is the bottom left, Blue's iconic mural overlooked and drew tourists to the site and continued to feature on kind of key uh, photographic collections of Berlin street art in general. Um, okay, so after a fire ripped through the settlement in September 2014, so this is all pretty recent, its occupants were evicted and its buildings levelled. In turn, the incentive to redevelop the, group, uh, redevelop the whole plot grew and plans for the construction of 250 apartments, that's the bottom right, uh, that involved the destruction of the murals uh, were released. Um, so in response, a local resident started a campaign, an online campaign to have the murals uh, heritage listed uh, as part of a statement of the transformation of the formerly divided city and also as a kind of contribution of Berlin's general cultural identity. Um, these efforts actually connected to follow uh, kind of similar efforts by Grüne Party politicians elsewhere in the city, but gained only limited political support, partly because they were all putting their weight behind the development plans, the media spree development plans. So politicians kind of basically re-emphasised that even if listing was possible for these murals, the development would go ahead uh, unchanged. Others, meanwhile, questioned whether they'd gained significant age value. We're talking about seven years from the first one, and that was repainted in 2008. Still, of, on, this, uh, on this campaign, 8,000 people signed uh, in the first couple of months, and it would have surely have attracted the 10,000 people, 10,000 names it needed to force a kind of more prolonged uh, political debate, if uh, what happened next hadn't occurred. So... <laughs> During the night, again, the right, top right should be a gift, never mind. During the night of the 11th of December 2014, the tumor, tumorals were painted black, causing an immediate social media storm. Uh, people on Twitter speculated that the owner and investor of the plot had, uh, was behind the buffing, but it was soon revealed that Henker and his team had carried it out with the permission of Blue. 
Henkel later explained that the act of auto-iconoclism, and this is his term, was an attempt to combat the mural's misuse by the forces of gentrification. There's some great quotes. He's actually published a paper on this. Um, it's really interesting read. Um, the buffing was widely supported online by street art and graffiti fans who were well accustomed to the transience of the art form and also kind of appreciated the artist's right to decide the fate of their works. Um, but the leader of the campaign to have them listed, however, um, kind of found it a bit difficult to fully endorse uh, the anti-gentrification statement. As he explained, street art belongs above all to the viewer, and if we performed the same actions to the whole of Kreuzberg, we would have to demolish the city in order to leave the enemy no bridge to cross. In short, so you get this, this is where you get the point, the question came, heritage is, uh, you know, officializing this uh, art form. Uh, in short, the campaign leader may have hoped to protect the murals for everyone, and quietly may be intended to delay or prevent the overall development, but Henker and Blue believe the heritage listing would uh, not only lead to the museumization, and they talk about a, z a zombification, a musealization, musealization, I can't say it, but not museumization, <laughs> hence why I wrote that one down, um, of the city, uh, but would also increase the market value of uh, and demand for the very development that's going on there. So there was rumors that the plans were gonna bring it away from the walls so that the, the flats could overlook Blue and JR's work. I feel like I'm struggling with time here. <laughs> um, so, to conclude this case study, <laughs> while the mural's physical preservation, I'm definitely struggling with time, uh, would never have been straightforward, their digital preservation had long been assured. Images and videos of the murals have been posted to social media throughout their existence, and these digital memories are still easily retrievable. Rather than digging down, the digital uh, graffiti archaeologists need only scroll down. In fact, Google Maps' street view still shows Blue and JR's uh, mural in its 2007 state. The murals overlapping virtual and real worlds are also demonstrated by the work of a group of artists called U plus 2210. They have also used uh, QR codes at the plot to create site-specific augmented reality uh, artworks. One of these, a textual piece that with the help of a smartphone renders the words work in progress across the two black, uh, blacked out walls, highlights how city walls like computer screens, and it, I think it's quite interesting, I think you mentioned off screen, off wall debate, um, always, these walls are always to a certain extent in a state of becoming, they're always buffering. Uh, this case essentially foregrounds the accelerated accumulation of digital archaeologies, uh, but also the accelerated life cycle of the murals themselves. As such, the mural's erasure was often described as a suicide rather than a natural death. That this suicide or auto-iconoclasm auto was captured so fully on social media means that the case might inform continuing debates about the relationship of heritage and erasure more broadly, but it also has resonance in terms of Blue's developing artistic practice. The creation of both murals was photographically documented while Blue was perf uh, perfecting his ambiguous ambition uh, ambiguous animation technique for his short film Muto. I don't know if anyone's seen this. Muto <coughs> combines street art and stop start animation techniques, but can only really be fully appreciated in film. The physical traces that it left on the streets and walls were only ever smaller elements of moments in a larger biographical work, now only viewable on um, YouTube. Okay, likewise, the curvy bracket walls can be appreciated as screens on which murals uh, were just on, on which blues murals were just one scene in an ongoing film that's played out across uh, the veil and the virtual spaces for the last seven years and continues to do so. Uh, the most recent scene involved a short uh, lived work uh, in June that only lasted a couple of days because of its explicit nature. So I think you can probably make it out in the bottom right here. Um, meanwhile, uh, the murals themselves live on in their digital afterlives. So the growing power and allure of these digital afterlives is evidenced by the way in which graffiti and street arts are changing their practices in the codes of the graffiti warfare. They are, for example, starting to facilitate their artworks, physical ephemerality, to avoid their acculturation while simultaneously playing on the more appropriate forms of permanence afforded by the internet and social media to gain greater exposure. So this is not only true of those artists with an international stature, it also applies to those who practice at the grassroots level, including, for example, those in Ho uh, Melbourne's Hosea Lane, the case study that Blackland will now discuss, and I can take a breather, yeah. and <laughs> I'll start playing his uh, file. I'll just minimise this for a moment. Okay, thanks, Sam. Uh, this is Lachlan McDowell. Coming to you from Melbourne, um, I'm sorry not to be in Glasgow for the conference, but um, I'm here to talk briefly about the second case study um, of this 
buffed and buffering paper, which is Melbourne's Hosier Lane. And if the technology is working, you'll see some images of Hosier Lane as I, as I talk. So I'm hoping that Sam has just outlined the contours of our argument, which is largely about um, thinking about the present moment in terms of the production and the consumption of graffiti and street art and the way in which they're being significantly shaped both by digital media and, and social media. And thinking about this in the context of the emergence of graffiti and street art as objects of heritage um, and the implications this has for a, a range of disciplines, including art history, conservation and also archaeology. So following Sam's discussion of the JR and Blue murals in Berlin, I'm going to briefly talk about um, a second case study, Hosier Lane in Melbourne. So the image that you see now is, is of that laneway and you can see um, a community choir having their photograph taken in the laneway. Um, just a little bit of uh, background. Hosier Lane's a small laneway in the centre of Melbourne and it began life in the 19th century as a service alleyway. It's lined with blue cobblestones and it's situated next to some key civic spaces. Um, it's near the major train station and opposite a major public art gallery. And it's now known as a landmark site for street art um, in Melbourne. The laneway is also uh, on the lands of the local indigenous tribes of the Kulin Nation. And there's a large mural of a young indigenous boy um, painted by the street artist Adnate that towers over the site. And the, the graffiti in the laneway often references indigenous identity. So just jumping back in 2010, the laneway had emerged as a key site in Melbourne. And I was commissioned at that time by the City of Melbourne and Heritage Victoria to undertake an audit of culturally significant street art in the municipality. And this uh, investigation was triggered by the accidental erasure of a number of spray painted stencils by, um, by Banksy. Um, and because of the kinds of cultural value, but also the economic value that were attached to Banksy artworks at that time, there was a broader interest in trying to think about um, questions of preservation and, and questions of value in relation to street art in the city. So I was asked to develop a framework that considered the kinds of value, cultural, social or aesthetic, that might attach to street art and to undertake a systematic audit of the municipality. And I was asked at that time to come up with a top 100 significant street artworks in the city. And I was somewhat resistant to this, uh, this kind of ranking exercise, uh, but I did try and respond to it by developing a fairly sophisticated framework um, that tried to capture the multiple domains in which street art works, this complex kind of spatial and social contexts um, that shape its meaning, to think a little bit about the forms of authorship um, that attach to street art, and to kind of argue against an idea that it can be reduced to individual artworks. So as such, Hosea Lane was listed in my top 100 as the most significant form of street art in Melbourne, and not because of any single piece of work, but more broadly because of its role what I termed a landmark site. And the laneway was a, termed a landmark site for, for basically four reasons. Firstly, it's a key site in the history of street art in Melbourne. It's one of the early places in the city where street art became entrenched. There was early galleries and light boxes attached to the walls. Um, it was also and remains a very productive site with new work being constantly remade. So if you wander down Hosier Laneway, as, as many uh, visitors to Melbourne do, you'll often see artists making work. And the, the work in the laneway may last um, a matter of hours, sometimes minutes. So it's a very active um, kind of space. It's a well-known site for tourists. Um, it's often visited by school groups and street art tours. And it also forms a key part of the branding and the visual identity of the city. So it's a, often a backdrop, a visual backdrop for formal and informal events. It features in our tourist brochures when you leave Melbourne Airport, there are pictures of Hosier Lane. And this is part of a broader context in which the laneways of Melbourne have been engaged as a kind of urban reform and development um, strategy. So the bars and clubs and small pop-up economic um, kind of ventures have become very much part of the story that we tell ourselves and others about um, Melbourne. 
So just jumping to the second slide, you can see a group of school children watching a graffiti mural being painted in um, a small laneway off Hosier Lane. So I'm trying to think about the um, way in which this laneway has functioned as um, a very active site. And I'm particularly interested in how over the last um, four years, broadly since 2010, um, it's, uh, th this activity has become amplified by the use of social media. Um, and I'm particularly, particularly thinking about from 2010, the rise of a digital platform called Instagram. So I'm sure and I'm hoping um, that many of you are familiar with Instagram. Um, so it's a photo sharing application um, that has become a one of the, the key digital platforms in, in social media. Um, it currently has um, over nearly 300 million users and it was recently purchased by Facebook for a billion dollars in cash and shares, which gives you some sense of the scale of the operation. So Instagram has been um, particularly taken up by graffiti writers and street artists. Um, so many of the world's most well-known street artists such as Banksy, JR, Osgemios and Shepard Fairey have in excess of um, three or four hundred thousand followers on Instagram. And the Australian street artist Lush you know, is also someone who's engaged really directly with the possibilities of the platform in the making of his artwork. So you can see in the third slide here a wall following a, a secret show um, a performance that Lush held last week in Hosier Lane. So Lush is a participating artist in the Banksy project uh, Dismal Land, um, and he staged a parallel kind of pop-up show here in Melbourne. You can see um, even just in the some some of the the tagging in this image, um, the nature of the performance was uh, was a parody about the commodification of of artwork and street artwork. So you can see uh, the word Visa and um, Amex, American Express, uh, down the bottom there. So this is uh, the leftovers um, from, from last year's show. But my broader argument here is that far from being simply a platform for the display of artworks, um, Instagram is fundamentally reshaping the practices, the aesthetics, and the consumption of street art. And it's transforming um, the... It's been transformed by digital media in general. Um, that's digital media in general, I think, is really... Um, changing the way that we think about and act in the street. Um, and then there's a, a more specific um, kind of shaping that's happening around um, street art. And, and that's made clear with the activities of artists like Lush, who, whose practice is, is really um, through forms of uh, performance and video and animations, really engaging with the possibilities of that uh, medium. You can see here in the fourth slide a, a search, the results of a search on Instagram for the place Hosea Lane, um, and you can see many people's um, images have been geotagged with the Hosea Lane location, um, and the, the photographing of the artworks, the possibility of wandering around the laneways, somewhat like a treasure hunt, um, and posting images of the work or images of yourself in, in front of the works is a very popular mode of interacting with um, the laneway space. Um, Hosea Lanes, um, as with many other parts of Melbourne, undergoing significant pressure from um, development and gentrification. So you can see in the fifth slide a poster for a campaign from a couple of years ago, Keep Hosea Real, which was a re response to the possibility of, of large scale, um, the building of a large scale hotel in the laneway. So currently the, that uh, project hasn't gone ahead. Um, and the site remains a very active um, kind of space for street art, but I think everyone who visits the site and who paints in the site is aware that it's quite a complex ecology um, there, and any change in the architecture or um, the social kind of context could easily see the, um, the, the ecosystem of the painting ecosystem um, kind of collapse. So I think Instagram's an interesting medium for thinking about the, this broader question of buffed and buffering because obviously Instagram offers a promise um, of um, capturing and retaining images of graffiti that are uh, generally uh, more ephemeral. Um, and this has, I think, amplified and, and changed the way that graffiti has been presented, particularly in sites like Hosea Lane. Um, and the, the, the broad um, direction of my artwork is to think about 
the way in which the wall in these contexts becomes um, not so much its, its usual function um, as, a, as a kind of billboard, but becomes more of a backdrop um, for the production of digital content, that artists are increasingly um, the primary kind of audience and the primary address of the artwork is a digital one rather than people who are physically in the space. And this means that the implication is that artworks don't have to last too long in the space. They can be repainted in a matter of hours, sometimes in a matter of minutes. Um, and just referring back to Sam's point about the blue mural in Berlin, often you'll see in Hosea Lane artists themselves are defacing or covering over their own artwork because they've achieved its primary goal of producing um, digital content for the, the insatiable platform of Instagram, which is always requiring new, um, new kind of images and new kind of content. So I'll finish this case study with a final uh, close-up of a wall from Hosea Lane that shows you some of the many layers of paint that have uh, accreted on the wall over the years. Um, and I think this is a nice image to think about that broader kind of context in which the, um, the digital platforms are accelerating and amplifying the, the painting of the walls, making them thicker and thicker, so that one artist has commented that the, the laneway itself is actually narrowing as the paint um, accretes uh, more quickly on the walls. Um, so this is, I think, um, also another way of thinking about Hosea Lane itself as a multi-layered space where the layers are not simply physical, um, but they have, you know, kind of digital, a range of digital kind of resonances. So in this, um, what I'm terming the Instagram era, um, we need to think about perhaps new forms of graffiti archaeology and how they might respond to the, the complexity of the site, its, its digital footprint, and to capture um, the many forms of value that are at play here in Hosea Lane. Um, and at this point, I will hand back to Sam. Right, just another 10 minutes. No, <laughs> I'm joking. I, okay, we're dangerously, really dangerously over time, so I'm not going to add hardly anything to that. Just that these questions that are coming through in all the papers today, I think we're touching on some of those. And particularly one that I'm interested in is what archaeology can bring to existing techniques like digital visual ethnographies that are going on a lot with graffiti already, um, because I think that's the key for the kind of graffiti archaeologists of the future. Thank you for uh, persevering. Thank you very much.